Oh, Hello yeah. and welcome back to the Human First CEO series on LinkedIn Live. I'm Nick Maida, CEO of Gainsight, and I am just totally floored to be joined by Stuart Butterfield, co-founder and CEO of Slack. Welcome, Stuart. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome to have you there with your huge collection of books behind you. We'll have to hear about those more uh, yeah. later. Um, but really excited to talk about this concept of what we call human first leadership. And the idea is basically a lot of companies are adopting a mindset where they have multiple stakeholders, customers, employees, their families, the community, and shareholders. And how does a CEO, how does a leader balance all of those? But Stuart, before we talk about all that, I'd love to talk about you as a human being and, and how you're getting through this uh, challenging time for all of us. And one question I like to ask people is, what's that uh, bucket list item that you're looking forward to doing post-COVID quarantine that keeps you motivated to kind of get through this? That's a tough one. Um, I'm, I'm upstate New York right now in the Hudson Valley. Yeah. And uh, getting back to New York City, or for that matter, Paris or Tokyo or any like city where there's just like the energy and the crush of people and on a warm evening, be able to sit outside and have a drink or some dinner and watch people go by. That's cool. I really wanted to be in New York City on Saturday because uh, it seemed like it was a fun place to be. So that is a, a good goal for both of us. Um, well, you know, the objective of this uh, series is to talk about kind of each of the different sets of stakeholders we have and how we think about them as leaders. And I've, I've just been a huge admirer of Slack. Um, I'm sure you have many of those. Uh, I personally have just obviously we use your product every single minute of every day. So you have great technology. But beyond that, I've seen you talk about all your stakeholders and try to balance them. And I'm, I'm sure it's not easy, but I'd love to start with the community. I think this year, more than probably any year in recent history, CEOs have had to realize that it's not just about the people inside your company, it's the folks around us. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can talk a little bit about how Slack thought about the community around you before COVID in 2020, and then maybe how that's changed with 2020. Um, yeah, it's... Uh... I wonder if it, I'm not sure if it's actually changed or if it's just like the circumstances are so different that it's manifested in, in a different way. We yeah. did, um, like a lot of companies, uh, pledge 1%. And, um, for those of you who are familiar, it's, you can pledge 1% of the company's equity, um, profits or employee time. We did the equity and employee time. And with the equity, we started a foundation called Slack for Good. And the mission of that is to increase the representation of people who have traditionally been underrepresented in tech, in tech. That's a, quite a sentence. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we gave employees a lot of um, volunteer, not a lot, but several days of volunteer time off. And you know, in some cases, those, those things kind of meshed together. And in some cases, they were local programs you know, for the uh, communities where we operated, which is you know, Dublin and San Francisco and Toronto and um, Osaka and all kinds of places. And um, what we saw when the pandemic started was all of these uses of Slack that were um, really emblematic of what we were trying to achieve as a company, it kind of, you know, besides the make money and, and, and stuff like that, like the kinds of uses that were really exciting suddenly were really important. So Slack is used by most of the world's leading university research labs in most disciplines. So that includes biology and pathology and epidemiology. And so suddenly these labs were uh, collaborating with each other a lot more than they were in the past. There was a ton of new organizations that sprung up like Frontline Foods that were able to scale really quickly to thousands of volunteers because um, they built on Slack the FBI and a bunch of uh, internet companies were sharing resources on fighting new cyber crime uh, models that emerged during the pandemic. So just like this, all of this usage anywhere. And um, we put up a PSA and we said, um, Slack's free for everyone fighting COVID. And um, the, the last thing, which I think probably had the biggest impact on us internally was everyone signed up for these one-on-one -on -one sessions. So to, you know, to the world, we were saying, um, if we can be helpful, take it. Uh, but we were also doing one-on-one -on -one training sessions for people who are curious and were just getting started. And so that was like a little bit of an administrative nightmare to schedule, but <laughs> hundreds of people inside the company spending time one-on-one -on -one with customers and prospective customers. That's awesome. And that must, I'm, I gotta figure that in addition to helping the community, that must have felt great for your employees to be able to connect their work to like what was so kind of topical at the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. One of the things I've seen, uh, and I think this might have been some, something you're passionate about even pre-COVID, was the Next Chapter program. Mm -hmm. um, and can you talk a little bit about that as sort of another way that you think about your role in the community? Sure. Uh, so that's um, this 
kind of Slack for good, uh, but it's done in partnership with the Kellogg Foundation, um, an organization called Free America, which is, I think, founded by John Legend, or at least he's, he's very involved. And um, a great group called uh, The Last Mile, who have been doing in-prison training programs for software engineering for like at least a decade. So I went to San Quentin to visit them probably four or five years ago. And since then, hundreds of, of Slack employees have gone. And it's a trip. Like there's people learning to code. Uh, they don't have access to the internet, so they can't just look something up on Stack mm -hmm. Overflow. They're also making apps for iPhones, and some of them never had an iPhone. Uh, people wow. you know, were incarcerated before there was Facebook. You know, we're trying to like wrap their head around Facebook and apps and um so, you know, that's not going to be the vocation of most people coming out of the prison system. Um, but it, there are people, you know, th there should be like the same kind of breadth of opportunity available to those people um, as there is to everyone, you know, where there's talent, uh, there should be opportunity. And we decided to try to figure out how to actually incorporate people into the workforce. And there's a bunch of challenges. So we're, you know, cool San Francisco, progressive, like liberal company. And everyone's like, yeah, formerly incarcerated people, we want to support them. And then, um, you know, then we say, okay, this guy's going to start next week. And they're like, oh, what did he do? Like, what was he convicted of? Mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly it's like, a, it's a different feeling. Um, and there's like that, you know, that class of, of concern. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, not just customers in regulated industries, but just in some cases, regulations that prevent us from hiring people with felony convictions in certain roles. And uh, there might be some version of one of those laws that makes sense, but generally they really don't. They're just like excessively punitive. And so kind of pushing to, um, to, to turn again, and I think I probably talked this whole time without actually saying what it was. Next chapter is an a <clears throat> program, um, brings in people, formerly incarcerated people, um, trains them up to be software engineers. Our first cohort was three people, all of whom made it and are full time Slack employees now. And that's uh, awesome. Zoom and Dropbox are working with us now. There's a couple other companies that haven't announced yet, and there's like it's a bigger and bigger uh group. That's amazing. Yeah, that's. I mean, I'm very passionate about that area as well. So I love love that you're focused on it. Out of curiosity, do you when you think about the areas that Slack gets involved in, you know, whether it's let's say an area like kind of uh, justice and kind of you know prison reform and things like that, or other areas, do you personally try to guide that, or do you have the employees kind of decide where you focus your community efforts? There's a little bit of both. No, I, so I mean, I, I'm uh, not shy with my opinions, but certainly don't. Um, direct it you know there was a i went and saw or i was at a conference and brian stevenson spoke and it had a real impact mm -hmm. on me. um and so this is i think 2015 maybe the company gift um was from me and i just bought everyone a copy of just mercy and you know also, oh yeah i got coffee mug and some coffee and, and tea and stuff like that um but because it, it really had uh touched me and the note um someone found and, and showed me just recently and it was like Slack in, in late 2015 was just really on top of the world. You know, like we, we had already done a billion dollar round or probably by that point, like a multi-billion dollar financing round. We're growing a hundred percent a year and every, you know, it's like all, um, all love, uh, and positive attention and stuff like that. And the message was to, in times like this, to kind of remember what it feels like when you're not on top, remember what it feels yeah. like, um, if you've had this experience of, of being on the bottom and uh, be both mindful and kind of ideally helpful to people who aren't, who are struggling, who aren't doing so well. Um, but, you know, you look around the company and there's people who are um, passionate about Alzheimer's research or mm -hmm. environmental causes or domestic violence, or, you know, like there's a whole um, wealth. And I, th I think that's probably, um, I mean, it is a good and healthy thing at Slack, just like it would be anywhere, because there's a lot of causes that are important to people and there's a lot of action that needs to happen. And so seeing that variety of engagement, I think is important. I love that. And that's actually, I think both both allowing the variety of engagement, but the, the fact that you had a personal touch to it with the gift, that, that's really moving. So let's talk about a little bit more than the, the team inside Slack. I think most people know Slack's world renowned for having an amazing culture and just hi attracting some of the best people out there. and also celebrating diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity, and you really are a role model. Can you talk a little bit about the the values of Slack and kind of how those sort of enable a lot of the the culture and success you've had? Yeah, there's um, 
a book which had a big impact on me and I, I really do not recommend it because it's kind of like academic philosophy and I read it when I was in grad school. <laughs> but, um, there's a, a long passage which I, I really like to quote and I'll give you the short version. It's that um, people who start businesses and they weren't talking about you know tech startups in this book. It was written, I think, in the 80s or something. Um, when people who start businesses do it because they want to create some kind of identity that is relevant or meaningful or that they care about. And, you know, just stepping out of this for a second, um, pandemic has obviously hit a lot of small businesses really hard, but even in the time before, anytime I drive past a, a you know, a restaurant that went out of business um, or a little, a retail store or something like that, it's always heartbreaking, right? Cause you know, it is yeah. um, almost always that's like, all of the family's resources, net worth, and they're going to go bankrupt and stuff like that. But also no one starts a restaurant to get rich, right? So why do they do it? It's like, you know, they, we don't have like the cooking from the country that I'm from here, or I, like I cared about the way my mom did it, or uh, I just want to, you know, there's an idea I have for an environment or a style or, or whatever. The same thing is true for all of these businesses. Like people are motivated by money, um, but, in this quote from the book, Disclosing New Worlds, they say, uh, if you think about a company as a machine for producing profits, you're mistaking a diagnostic of its performance for its purpose, right? So we're both, Nick, of an age where we got to get checkups every once in a while. And I think it's important to keep your cholesterol on a certain range and blood pressure and stuff like that. That's not the purpose of my life, you know? But, right. Um, and I think... Have the both the top and bottom line are important diagnostics of the performance of the business, but they're not the reason that the business came to exist in the world. And you know the exact reasons I think are difficult to articulate. And there's probably you know multiple motivations. And it's like everyone you said we attracted all these great people. Everyone who chose to come there kind of brought a little slice of it um, with themselves. And there's this broader identity that's kind of created through us, obviously, you know, in our deliberate actions, but also the interactions we have with customers and the things that they do and the things that people say about Slack. And, um, you know, that's what it's all about, I think. Like, that's that's the ultimate purpose. Um, it's, well, I'll quote one more book. And here, in this case, you basically get the whole value of the book just from the first two sentences. The book's called <laughs> and Infinite Games. And the first two sentences are, there are at least two kinds of games finite games, which are played for the purpose of winning, and infinite games, which are played for the purpose of continuing the play. So like music is like that, art is like that, I think entrepreneurship is like that, mm -hmm. culture is like that, religion is like that. It's just like this kind of elaborate, spontaneous, improvisational um, act of creation. So I don't have an idea the extent to which other people at Slack would give you <laughs> the same answer, and I kind of doubt it would be exactly the same. Um, but I think there's an element of, of that. Like people want to work someplace they're proud of. Um, it doesn't have to be self-sacrificing, like I'm in the jungle, you know, fighting malaria to go save people's lives, or I work for Medicine Sans Frontieres or something like that. Um, but nevertheless, you want it to be uh, helpful and have some kind of impact that you care about. That's in incredible, Stuart, I, I, in so many levels. First of all, I, I am a total nerd about reading philosophy books. I'm just probably going to read both of the books you just recommended. So, um, but on a, on sort of on a meta note, like the reason we do this series is that we, like one of the purposes of our company is to sort of espouse a more human approach to business. And that's sort of like become part of our identity. So I think that's really interesting. And one of the things I wrestle with a lot, and I'm curious how you think about it is the identity in some ways, like any emergent uh, phenomenon is, is formed by the collective actions and experiences of all the participants, including you most notably, but all the others. Do you yeah. feel like the identity of Slack has evolved over time or, or changed, or do you feel like it's the same as early days? Like, how, how do you think about that? No, I think it's definitely changed and evolved. You know, like um, when we talk to um, regulated customers in Europe about whatever the most recent change was to data protection laws and our ability to accommodate them with the compliance functionality and international data residency and blah, blah, blah. That's a very different vibe than the, you know, the 2014 <laughs> kind of cheeky upstart. Um, I, you know, I might not be a great person to ask about it just because I, you know, my perspective is so from the inside. Um, right. Um, but, uh, but it's definitely changed and evolved and, part of that kind of growing up or, or scaling, I think is losing a little bit of your identity. And I don't mean that necessarily in a negative way, 
But you know how little kids are all weirdos? Like they're all just unique and they're, like they just do strange stuff that adults don't do. And kind of, as we grow up, we get a little bit more conformist. And again, I don't really mean that in a, in a bad way, but we come, become more like one another. Um, right. So I think there's an element of that in, in Salaka. There's still a, a spirit that's very much common, but it's a little bit like a, you know, a, a three-year-old versus a 15-year-old or a 30-year-old. I think it's a great analogy. You're, you're right. And actually, I wrestle a lot with not losing the spirit, but still growing up. I think that's a, that is a good articulation of the challenge. Now, getting a, a little less uh, theoretical, although I could, I could speak about this forever, uh, and to now the, the more practical side of leading teams and, and driving success for teams, Slack is the center, uh, one of the center foundational technologies for distributed and remote work. And I don't know how a remote company would run without it. Um, I saw that you hired chief people officer outside the Bay Area. I think it was at Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're really embracing this in your own company. Can you talk about what that transition feels like in the, the company that, you know, helps us all work remotely? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's a, it's a little scary. And even before this, um, you know, decisions about real estate are probably for, for software companies, the longest lead time decision that you have to make because it's like, you say, well, okay, we'll sign that lease. And then two years later, you, you move in. Um, and you probably had the experience of by the time it's ready to move in, you're, you're too big for that place. Yeah. Um, now it's, you know, it's kind of, there's an element of that. And there's also like, what are offices even going to be? You know, when, right. when we started, we were just about, we had uh, signed a lease on a new place in, in Dublin and we were just about to start construction when everything shut down. And we weren't sure when we came back, like, the first thing they do is like all the stuff that goes under the floors, all the wiring and is the layout of the office even going to be the same? Um, so we're definitely going to still have physical offices, but I don't remember who said this first, but I, I, there's a great use of, uh, of a bit of jargon. We think about unbundling the office. So think about yeah. the different purposes that it serves. And one of them is, um, you know, it's a projection of power. We've got the, our logo on the side of the building and it's uh, a cultural touchstone for the employees and it's a place to host customers and recruits. Uh, it's a social space, um, you know, a place for, for creativity and invention. And then kind of like the least interesting and useful purpose and the one that takes up the greatest amount of square footage is factory farm, like battery chicken housing for people to sit at their desk with their headphones on <laughs> and just use their computer by themselves, which, cause that part they could do anywhere. Uh, right. We started a new organization or kickstarting it called Future Forum to look into a lot of the stuff. And the first bit of research they did was uh, came back as 12% of people want um, to go back to the way things were. So uh, over 70% of people mm -hmm. basically just want more flexibility. Right. And uh, the ramifications for that, I think, are really enormous. And uh, I'm enthusiastic about this future and I want to use it as an opportunity. I also think that people have much less choice than they believe they currently have. And what I mean by that is, you know, if, if uh, you say you're going to hire people wherever they live and Twitter says that and Salesforce says, yeah. and I say, no, you got to work in the office. We'd have to be a, a lot better employer to be able to pull. Totally. Them. Um, and we'd also lose our current employees who want that flexibility because it's not just I want to move to like the remote woods or something like that. It's I want to be closer to my family or I want to have a you know big enough house. The house that I can afford uh, is outside of the commuting distance that I'm really you know, going to be practically comfortable with commuting every day. But I'll come in a couple times a week. You know, I'll, I'll come in from Sacramento to the city or something like that. Um, and those changes, you know, those choices that people are making today are not ones that you can easily unwind or reverse when, when offices reopen. So I think none of us are really going to have that much of a choice. There's going to be a lot more flexibility. We're going to have to change the style of the way we work to support it. Um, and right now, I think we're just very open-minded and inquisitive and experimental and, and curious about the ways in which we can improve uh, how we work. Last thing I'll say is one thing we're sure about is trying to find ways to take processes that today must be synchronous and make them asynchronous. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, we announced a bunch of features recently that aren't coming out for a little while yet, but one of them is essentially Instagram stories. And instead of the daily mm -hmm. stand up as a call, I record mine, my update at 8.53 and I listen to yours at 10.51, awesome. when, you know, whenever it's convenient for me. Um, and now there's like one less meeting. And the, it's not, I mean, I think there is a time savings, but that's not even the issue. It's the increase in flexibility. Cause one, yeah. 
yeah, look, really interesting thing is I'd never thought about this before. Um, up until the industrial revolution, people got paid for what they produced. You know, so if you were a baker or a blacksmith or a miller or whatever, you know, you, you sold your stuff and that's how, how much money you got or how much barter you had. Um, and in the industrial revolution, companies started paying people for time. And the only way to make that practical was to get everyone to work at the same time. So you could kind of keep an eye on them and make sure that you were getting the, the time that you bought, um, which is a real tyranny, you know, to, to have to be eight, a.m. till 5 p.m. or whatever it is and these rigid breaks because people want to be able to pursue their own creative activities or hobbies or they have other obligations or they have kids they want to teach or like whatever it is. Um, so the degree to which we can give people back some of that flexibility, I think that's a huge win. Now, obviously today for parents who don't have childcare, it's a necessity. Um, right. But like in the, in the, forever, it's going to be a huge boon. You know, if you got to um, you know, come work at Gainsight four hours a day, we need you to be kind of in in sync with everyone else on, on your team that you're working with. Um, but for the rest of the time, you work early morning, you work late night, you work, you know, take a nap in the afternoon or go work out when you feel like working out or, or take care of whatever you need to take care of. It's a really attractive offer. Um, and I think that'll be, you know, a mainstay of uh, employee relationships with their employer going forward that, that's that's so powerful and thoughtful and i think i think the idea of distributed and then asynchronous as being two related and sort of complementary things I, I i we run a very global company like you do and you know synchronous is not possible with global anyways right because of the time zones and all that so mm -hmm. and that's actually super exciting to see you all innovate in that area because i think all of us will benefit from it so I, i'll I'll, I'll, I'll switch to the third chapter, which I kind of contractually have to always talk about, which is customer success. That's my, that's sort of my life. Um, but I actually think it's kind of your life too. And that like the way you built Slack is at least what I've watched from the outside has been sort of very oriented towards the user and customer from the beginning, even before you had a customer success team. So mm -hmm. maybe you could talk about how it was sort of built in the philosophy of the company and then how a customer success team with Christina's team kind of maybe accelerates that even more. Yeah. So I don't know that we had like a, there's no written charter or, or something, but obviously it was just intuitively important that customers matter. Um, <laughs> but I think there was also a couple of foundational beliefs uh, that we didn't write into the constitution, but were, were really common to everyone who's there in the early days. And one was um, in, in the long run, the measure of our success will be the amount of value we create for customers because you can't fake it in the end, right? Uh, totally, you can totally. get to the point where you have a kind of monopolistic power and, and you know, in the hundred year trajectory towards the, the death of the company, you can extract some rent on the way or something. But we only win when people choose Slack. Like we don't have a different way of getting them to, uh, to use it. And if they're going to choose it, it's because they think it has real value. So it not only has to... Um, have value for them, they have to recognize it um, and they have to understand it. And Slack's a new category. So that's a real challenge. So from the very earliest days, before I even, I never heard the phrase customer success. I didn't know it was, that that was a job. In fact, the first time I heard it was probably six years ago, you know, to mm -hmm. be honest. Um, but that's what we did. You know, for the first couple people who we got to try Slack, even before we had the beta, like just friends companies, we would go and hang out in their office all day and we would show them exactly how, how we were doing it and make suggestions for how they could do it and how they could get more out of it. And we would listen to their feedback and we would incorporate it and kind of, you know, uh, obviously in a much more casual way, but it was, we were kind of coming up with change management plans for them and doing some like um, services work and doing some integrations and, and stuff like that. Today, I say to customers all the time, I believe we have the best customer success team in the world. I mean, they're just, they're so passionate and they're so engaged. They pay such critical attention. Um, and obviously, you know, you're, you, you guys make a big contribution to that. Um, you're very, very, very well loved inside of the, the team. Um, I know Christina Thanks. just did something with you um, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, but uh, it's really, I mean, it's, it's absolutely critical to our business potentially maybe even more than the sales process itself because um, we get the customer and then we grow, right? We, right. We have these customers that have tens, thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees using Slack today. It's a long haul to get there. And every single one of them started with like one person turning to someone else and saying, do you want to try this? 
um, see how it works out. And then you get five people using it together and then eight. Um, and it's pretty easy for Slack to grow organically in that way to 50 people or 100 people or maybe even a couple hundred people. But, you know, it's the kind of product that if everyone goes home on Friday and they're using email to communicate and then 5,000 people show up for work on Monday and they're told they're going to use Slack, guaranteed failure. Like just 100% yeah, chance it'll totally. be a disaster. Um, so the success is an absolutely essential part of the evolution, part of that customer journey, and how we ultimately you know, uh, make money ourselves. That's awesome. Well, thanks for saying that. I, that is very, yeah, I, I can see in the way your team operates. Let me uh, close this out. So I always like to ask, uh, if you had a closing thought for others, tech CEOs on this concept of you know leading across all your stakeholders, what we call human first, and you want to give a piece of advice, anything that jumps out to you to other CEOs? Hmm. Um, not, uh, I don't believe that you'll get an answer to this, but it's always worth thinking about why are you doing this? Um, like yeah. really why are you doing this? So going back to the, you know, the early thing about uh, disclosing new worlds, one of the things they point out is, um, you know, what's the point of playing basketball? Is it to get as many baskets as possible? Because you can get more baskets if there's, you didn't put, you didn't play against anyone, you know, like just don't yeah. have, have an opponent, but that's obviously absurd, right? Um, you play because you want to be good at something. And um, if nothing else, I think recognition of that one impulse, you know, that um, like for me personally, I'll say, I think everyone is true to a certain extent. I feel like I get to play for the Brazilian national football team or in the Berlin Philharmonic, mm -hmm. you know, like I have to compete with the people who are the best in the world. Um, and it's a huge privilege and, and an honor. But in the very early days of Slack, one of the things we said, what, like one of the purposes of the company was to um, allow, enable, empower, now I can't remember what it was, uh, employees to exercise their craft. Cause it's just like, mm -hmm. feels good to do whatever it is that you do successfully yeah. at a high level. And we want to create opportunities for people to do that. That's incredible. I think that's just a great way to close. It's actually one of the, one of the deeper and more philosophical discussions I've had on this series. So thank you so much, Stuart. This has been amazing. Thanks yeah. to all of you watching as well. We'll see you on the next one of these and be well. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.